first uh, to Emily and Andrew um, for allowing me to speak. Um, it's the first time I've actually um, spoken when I've organised a conference, and I am now learning the error of my ways. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you very much. Um, I'm coming at this um, not from a frontiers background in Roman archaeology, really, um, but working for a number of, year, number of years in South Wales, um, excavating uh, the legionary fortress of Isca down in Killian, and now being sort of billeted up uh, in Diva uh, at Chester, um, I sort of thought um, it's perhaps high time these fortresses um, maybe kind of uh, made the front line perhaps of Roman frontier studies, because um, I don't get the feeling that they've, they've really been included as much as they could have been. Um, so um, we've had a look um, just now at um, the limits sort of, the, of the Roman Empire, um, quite a linear frontier when we look at the World Heritage Site inscription. Although it does um, obviously recognise that it's um, not just the installations, the forts, the fortresses, the towers, it's the Limes Road, um, artificial barriers and immediately associated civil structures. So even in, um, for those uh, parts of uh, the Roman um, frontier, or the limit of the Roman Empire, um, it's sort of, it, even those ones that are inscribed, um, it is sort of recognising that there's some sort of depth to this frontier zone, um, even in the inscription. Um, but um, only part of it is inscribed, um, as we sort of see on this map. Um, and I just want to look at sort of Britain at the end of that. Um, it's quite unique, I feel. Um, yes, we've got um, the two walls that might have formed territorial um, borders at one or, one or you know, several points in time. Um, but what about the coast as a border? Um, the borderline of the frontier between Britannia um, and Barbaricum, or immediately, if we look at the sort of western coast of Britain, uh, you've got an immediate sort of barbarian uh, population over in Hibernia. Uh, no offence if anyone is Irish in this room. <laughs> um, so, um, and this is sort of a prominent thing in uh, very current uh, politics and uh, sort of thought about current affairs on the verge of Armageddon, um, sorry, Brexit. Um, <laughs> the, this kind of, this border uh, between Britain and Ireland uh, is coming back to the sort of forefront um, of, of modern life. Um, but I think also it's, it's a borderland that potentially um, needs further investigation, as Peter mentioned, in the Roman world. It, it existed in the Roman world as well. So beyond the sort of the, the World Heritage Site inscription as it's sort of written, um, we're looking at military sites for this frontier, um, connected civil settlements, but these are places of exchange. It's already been quite well established that they're places of exchange, of interaction. They are not necessarily hard borders, uh, they are permeable, and therefore can potentially be seen as sort of cultural melting pots, um, if you like. Um, and that's sort of mirrored um, in the way in which um, I think from the sort of outside looking in, frontiers in uh, the Roman world have been studied. And I think this is something that Richard <coughs> mentioned earlier in the question sort of approach. Is the term frontier actually something like the term Romanization? Is this something that we're now moving away from uh, through the post-colonial approaches? And much more recently, publications have been very much more about frontier identities, um, sort of abstract features of frontiers, um, the way in which the sort of geographic and cultural borders are not always perhaps clearly defined, um, the existence of migrant populations, interaction beyond the frontiers. Um, and to try to deal with some of these nuances that are sort of emerging in, in Roman frontier and general sort of Romano-British archaeology, um, the, front, the sort of issues between what's a border, is a border a line, a frontier, is it a region, is it, is it sort of a zone uh, with perhaps many different lines and boundaries within it. So to try and tackle with all, all of these things and uh, perhaps bring in some more current sort of theories um, sort of permeating Romano-British archaeology, such as globalisation theories, Andy Gardner's uh, Great Britannia paper uh, on institutional archaeology, as well as sort of think about applications of analytical sort of frameworks to understand this stuff. I wanted to come at it slightly differently, um, with a view to considering um, perhaps the affects and effects of borderlands or being in a borderland or a frontier, um, specifically the sort of space um, that we now know is sort of Wales and Northwest England. So 
I wanted to think beyond our traditional understanding of um, assemblages as distinct sort of groups of materials, perhaps based on shared typology or material, um, and think perhaps more of them um, as a shared sort of archaeological context of varying scales being the important thing. Um, but approach them in terms of perhaps um, social complexity. Um, so very much uh, drawing on current sort of theories of assemblage theories um, in archaeology. So as a quick ladybird guide um, to uh, assemblage theory in archaeology, um, because it wouldn't be tag without a bit of theory. Um, derived essentially from um, Deleuze and Guattari's um, sort of theories of assemblage, um, or I should say agencement, uh, this is actually the French word, uh, assemblage is the English translation, uh, to arrange. Um, they sort of looked at it very much as a way of, of thinking about the social world. So in which it sort of sees social formations as assemblages of other complex configurations, objects, materials, people, events, memories, which in turn play a part in other configurations. So it particularly foregrounds um, the deliberate act of bringing things together, um, of entities, beings, um, essentially sort of coming together, therefore stressing that agency that's involved in that process. And these sort of ideas uh, have been picked up by various people. I've just picked out some sort of key names. Um, Delanda um, really concentrated um, sort of concepts now known as assemblage theory, and um, very much arguing um, for sort of the assemblage theory, the relations among the parts um, of the assemblage are contingent, but they're not necessary. So that a part may be, may be detached from an assemblage and made a component of another assemblage. So sub assemblages can essentially be fragmented. And this is the sort of things that, that John Chapman explores, looking at the sort of relational character of assemblages. Um, so the, juxtapi sorry, the juxtaposition and renegotiation of elements can be therefore quite transformative. Um, more recently, uh, the multiplicity of assemblages has been forefronted. Um, as well as the, sort of the importance of affectivity, um, especially sort of tying in, I think we've got a session later at TAG that I think Andy's even organising, uh, tying in with the sort of concept of flat ontologies um, and dealing with all of these, um, so well, ontologies, in fact, <laughs> um, as we had earlier. Um, and particularly I wanted to draw on um, Yanis Hanalakis' paper um, published in 2013 in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, which I think... Uh, for me, put everything sort of quite coherently um, and sort of brought out four key um, elements of, of assemblages. Um, and Hamalakis argues um, that a fundamental uh, property of all assemblages um, is their sensorial and affective import. Essentially, they are arrangements of material and immaterial entities. Therefore, they're multiple, they're varied, they're layered, and they're heterogeneous. They're about material and sensorial memory as well as about the engendering of diverse temporalities. So the assembling or arrangement, essentially, of diverse bodies or people, uh, things, affairs, <coughs> senses and memories, involves by implication the sort of that uh, co-mingling of um, and the, contin the contingent co-presence um, or happening of lots of different diverse sort of temporal moments. Um, so at the same time, um, this sort of assemblage or arrangement is, is political in the sense that it is a, de a deliberate co-presence of multiplicities. Um, albeit that co-presence is not always intentional, um, but that deliberate act of bringing things together assumes an ability or power of a social agent to do that in some way. Um, so thinking about how all of this might help us think about frontiers or perhaps border spaces um, was what uh, some harebrained idea I had uh, one night. Um, and I'd like to sort of explore some of this uh, potentially with regards to the Western frontier of Britannia. So um, we've already been introduced to Chester a couple of times um, today. Um, I've already mentioned that we're looking potentially at a sort of a coastal border. We're not, we've not got a wall. Um, the, the sort of Western frontier traditionally has all has been sort of studied as the Roman frontier in Wales, um, with Nash Williams' work that was then revised by um, Mike Jarrett, and sort of moving into the Welsh marches um, with Barry Burnham and Jeff Davis's publication looking at the Roman frontier in Wales and the marches. Um, I think that if we want to sort of think about this as a borderland and an assemblage 
and that sort of connectivity, um, we're probably looking at a much broader geographic depth, uh, potentially. Um, but if we think about the coastline as the border, um, we've got quite a networked frontier or sort of borderland of, of military installations, but with two key sort of nodal points at either end of it, potentially. Uh, Chester, obviously, in the north, and the legionary fortress down at Killian in the south. Um, it's a long-standing frontier, um, as we will sort of see in a minute. Uh, that military control or presence continues from the AD 70s all the way through pretty much to the early 5th century in some format. Um, admittedly not equally um, around this, this area. <coughs> um, and I must admit, um, the political side of things, um, what I want to sort of draw out today, um, and I know it's something that I think Andy said in the earlier discussion, um, is rather Roman-centric. Um, and I think, uh, so forgive me for that um, in the next sort of few case studies, um, but it's just a way of, sort of uh, for illustrative purposes, <coughs> I suppose, um, rather than um, any polit sort of <coughs> particular stance on, on the approach. Um, but then we've got a temporal frontier, it's political, it's vastly diverse, um, and hugely effective, I think, depending on your experience of it um, at the time. So we perhaps start to see the emergence of a frontier um, in the archaeological record um, with the various sort of temporary marching camps, campaign camps, which are often quite hard to date. Um, but we start to see sort of more um, military bases through the sort of pre-Flavian, through into the Flavian sort of conquest um, of the 70s and 80s. Um, as you start to see this sort of network of military installations moving further north and west, um, by the 130s, um, I think everyone's pretty happy that this area is very much conquered and now it's about maintaining uh, that as part of a, a Roman province. So we see um, a more permanent garrison emerge with the construction in stone of most military installations that are still in use. Um, and the slight drop off from the 150s onwards suggesting that um, perhaps the sort of the type of control or the need for control um, is changing in this area. But the military presence continues um, all the way through, um, as I said earlier, to the early 5th century in some format. So despite the shifting internal sort of dynamics of this, this sort of frontier zone, um, the coastal border remains some sort of um, limit of the Roman territorium, uh, but internally these new sort of administrative borders that we see um, make the sort of 4th century frontier look very different um, to that of the later 1st and 2nd um, centuries. Isca, for example, is largely abandoned um, in the 3rd century with a new fort emerging at Cardiff, um, and as we heard, perhaps some of the legion um, going over to Richborough as well. Um, so we have these different zones um, working together to maintain um, that sort of limit, western limit of, of Roman Britannia, still very much focused around the Irish Sea Zone, um, the closest point to Hibernia. Um, and thinking about the temporality of um, assemblages, we've even sort of um, increasing this assemblage today. The more discoveries we have, the more sites we identify. It's, we also need to think about this assemblage um, in its sort of modern context as well. Um, but as a politic, in a political sense, and it's sort of you can look at an assemblage and the politics of an assemblage on various levels. Um, but for ease and sort of illustrative purposes, um, perhaps at the upper end, the most explicitly intentional co-presence of multiplicities um, relates to the social agent that I suppose is the Roman state, or I should say, uh, more directly, the Roman military as the sort of uh, facilitating arm of, of the Roman state. You've got the major political powerhouses um, of Diva um, and of, of Isca, as I mentioned, um, both classic playing card shapes, nothing that we aren't particularly untoward in Roman sort of military terms. Um, we've got Chester being 20% bigger than the other fortresses in Britain, um, likely due to, um, as Peter mentioned earlier, the idea that this was going to be the capital. There's also um, suggestions that this might have been for an invasion of Ireland, um, which then never really happened. Um, so some interesting buildings inside Chester and outside Killian is where you find the extramural areas where you find the interesting buildings there. Uh, perhaps 
again, looking at the link between military and administ uh, administrative control um, in a particular temporal context and geographic position. Um, but they've both um, got good access out to the Irish Sea, whether it's via the D estuary or the Severn estuary in the Bristol Channel. Um, they are um, also um, working, I think, together um, to sort of maintain the, the land space between the two. So you've got this sort of co-presence of um, two massive great military sites. And thinking about the affectivity of this on one level, I wanted to think about this military presence in the sense of its materiality. Um, and we can do that in many ways, but um, I'd like to focus just quickly on the materiality of the fortresses, or the fortresses themselves. Um, the monumental stone, for example, that we find um, these fortresses built out of, especially at Chester, if you haven't been down to the North Gate yet, uh, you've got a fantastic bit of cornicing um, on the remaining uh, sort of Roman wall. Uh, quite unusual, quite fancy for a Roman fortress in Britain. Um, otherwise, you've got um, lots of sort of Mediterranean building styles in, in this sort of extramural building um, here. Um, but also just the general kind of presence of brick and tile that would have been used by the Roman military in their architecture. Um, surely would have had a profound effect on people. <clears throat> on one hand, um, its effect on the local sort of conquered population, uh, a sign of solidly confirming the enduring presence of Rome, uh, perhaps the martial state that they might be living under for a time, as Barry Burnham and Jeff Davis describe, designed to overawe the vanquished. Quite like that term. Um, and if you think about the construction of these places, the landscape change that that must have um, included, uh, bringing in elements of the landscape into this assemblage. For example, we've got in the archaeological evidence um, at Killian, we've got um, the evidence for uh, quite large-scale deforestation around the same time that the fortress is being built. So for people living in this area, familiar with these landscapes, it really must have been um, quite um, dramatic. But on the other hand, the consistent use of such building materials in the lay and the layout of military installations would have likely created quite a sense of security and familiarity for those serving in the army, or perhaps those associated with it, especially when you're posted at what's potentially the arse end of the empire, um, you know, up in North Wales or South Wales, far from home, you've got that, that sort of security and familiarity of your surroundings, um, regardless of how many hundred miles away you might be from your home. Um, and it's the sort of people as well, I suppose, it's like the people uh, that make up the army um, that also form part of this assemblage. Um, the Legio um, 20 Valeria Victrix um, being a sort of more permanent um, garrison up at, Chest um, at Chester, the Legio 2 Augusta um, at um, Isca Augusta um, or Isca Solurum down in South Wales. Um, the idea, or the sort of general consensus, um, is that these were sort of became almost like police forces of this landscape, um, with their reaches perhaps actually branching out um, well beyond, as I said, uh, Roman Wales, um, actually sort of well up into the northwest for Chester potentially, um, and well across the Severn Estuary. Um, there's some evidence for the Second Augustan Legion. But for what purpose and what intent? Um, were, they, were these particular legions chosen? And this is a question that I've quite often had and never really had the time to follow it up. Um, and what or who are they meant to be policing? You know, uh, David uh, Richard suggesting earlier about is frontier the wrong term? And I wonder whether this sort of Western frontier, if I've coined it, is technically a frontier in this sense. But these people um, would not have been Britons. Uh, I think we're all familiar with this concept. Um, so we know, we know we've got evidence that these two legions are made up of Gauls, people from Germania, uh, modern day Spain, um, North Africa, Near East. And this kind of brings us to, I suppose, one of the elements of heterogeneity. Um, that sort of diversity of the population that makes up this assemblage, um, I think, um, is something obviously that applies to Roman provincial studies um, generally, more widely but it's something that I think we really need to think about in the makeup of the frontier assemblage. Um, and with that, uh, this sort of uh, mix of languages, of cultural traditions, are we starting there to see contested boundaries within these frontier zones, cultural 
uh, religious boundaries, linguistic boundaries perhaps. We've got um, Greek doctors in Chester setting up altars. We've got in Kalean, um, we've got a, a military family essentially. Um, what looks like a Roman serving soldier has married a local girl, had two children, a son and a daughter. The son dies while away on expedition, on the German expedition fragmenting that assemblage and perhaps incorporating a different assemblage. Um, she sets up the tombstone for her mother and um, her brother um, buried next to her father's tomb. <coughs> and that's, that sort of diversity, that heterogeneity uh, is not just going to be sort of um, dependent on who you are or where you come from. The diversity in the backgrounds of people serving in the army or migrating to Britannia, um, yes, would have resulted in a discrepant experience, perhaps, depending um, on who you were and what your background was, but also where you were and when in the frontier zone you would have lived or experienced. For example, um, there does appear to be a real north-south divide. Um, it was real in the Roman period, and many people, as I've come up to the north, now agree that it definitely exists even now. Um, <laughs> but we can trace it back to even here. Um, so the Western frontier um, uh, sort of reflects, I suppose, Britannia more generally in, in some senses. Um, but the, the north of the Western frontier is, seems to be militarised for far longer than the south, perhaps relating to extraction of mineral resources um, that we see a lot of evidence for up in the north. For example, at Sigontium at Carnarvon, Peter mentioned earlier, um, sort of a, a campaign um, fought, set out in the, um, about AD 77, um, garrisoned until the end of the 4th century, um, and actually with an upswing in occupation and intensity in the late 3rd and early 4th centuries. Whereas Gethlegar down in South Wales, sort of uh, to typify the kind of South Wales picture a bit, um, again founded in around AD 74 to 78, a slightly smaller um, fought for 500 auxiliary rather than a thousand odd up in Sigontium, which also I guess says something, um, but um, appears to sort of really drop in its activity and its occupation um, after about 120 or 130 AD. And even the settlement outside or associated um, with these military installations is different. You have a lot more Viki thriving in mid and north Wales than we have in south Wales. Um, and this is even mirrored when we think about civil administration and, and the urban landscape of the frontier, which is pretty sparse, actually. Um, and when we put this all together, um, we sort of have to think about what this frontier zone really is and what it's doing. Um, is it about controlling people? Is it about controlling resources? Um, we haven't got Kivitas capitals further sort of north or west than Roxeter. But then perhaps what does that tell us about Roxeter's role in this assemblage? Um, and so, you know, we, we have small towns develop in the south, but nothing really um, in the north of the frontier. Um, and it's not just a north-south divide. Even within the north of um, sort of uh, northeast Wales and into sort of Cheshire, although Cheshire's, um, I think, slightly different um, the further sort of east you get, um, but we tend to find that um, there's quite a continuation of Iron Age settlement. A lot of rectilinear enclosures, roundhouse architecture tends to be dominant. Um, a lack of complex enclosure systems, although Satan Camp um, has really sort of thrown a spanner in the works there over the last few years. Um, some, state, some low status villas, um, a fantastic site out at Poulton, um, which Kevin will be able to tell us about, which I think is currently quite unique, um, but a very sort of uh, long-lived and vibrant Iron Age settlement in going into the Roman period. Um, but the sort of levels of connectivity suggest that you've potentially got um, quite um, a sort of a stark contrast between those who are either associated with the military um, in some way, whether that's retirement, whether that's through industry and trade, and those who are not. And those who are not, um, for whatever reason, um, appear to have quite poor material culture assemblages. Um, some of that might be preservation issues, but I think um, largely in North East Wales, not necessarily the case in all parts of, of the region. Um, 
And those where we do have sort of highly kind of Romanized or um, sort of military objects um, do tend to have this sort of military link. So for example, Place Koch, Peter's mentioned, um, Flint as well. Um, Place Koch possibly a sort of villa-like building, uh, possibly being interpreted as a sort of a veteran settlement for supplying grain for the military. Uh, Flint, um, we've got uh, Pentra Farm and Croisati, um, where you've got a ribbon settlement along the road, lead working, linked to the Flintshire um, lead fields, um, sort of at Halkin, and at Halkin there's a very high le uh, silver content um, in the lead that's being extracted there. Water mills, docks and storehouses, um, workers' quarters. Um, we've also got the presence of a procurator um, metallorum as well at Croisati. Um, potentially being directly under the control of Chester. Um, so you've got the presence of the Roman military in this frontier zone, if that's what we want to call it, or it's borderland, but their presence is not solely just about the border itself. I think it's, it's also about access and control over mineral extraction that prolongs um, their presence there. So there seems to be, even sort of on a regional, sort of more localised level, a clear difference between the haves and the have-nots. Um, so what does this sort of suggest to us about the structure of frontier society, I suppose, in Western Britain? Is this have-not about um, the mnemonic... Ex mnemon I can't even say that. It's good, isn't it? You know that you're getting towards the end of the day when you try and say mnemonic. Mnemonic um, experience of conquest. Is it about resistance? I mean, this is an idea that's circulated for a very long time in sort of studies of Roman, Romano British archaeology. And um, is that sort of um, resistance to even access supply networks based upon the social memory of conquest? How long does that social memory last? Or is it more about um, access based on your social position, um, based on ideologies in some other way? Um, I've put up here um, an extract from Tacitus um, purely sort of about the Silurates, um, we're told by Tacitus about this sort of um, quite fearsome group of people that Julius Frontinus was fronted with. Um, and it makes you sort of think they're sort of brutally subjugated potentially. And if this is true, you know, how does that affect um, their sort of role or their input or their, um, their memory uh, and their involvement in this assemblage? Um, and I suggest that the mnemonic parts of the assemblage would have been as diverse as the temporal, the geographic, and the social context within which they were formed. So, can we look at a frontier, or what we've been calling frontiers, more as assemblages, where we can study um, their political nature at all levels, the way in which there are deliberate co-presence of multiple entities, and because of that, the way in which they are multiple and they are not homogenous, they are temporal, and the way in which that commingling of diverse people and temporal moments and objects all come together, um, and the way in which, it, therefore, they sort of the, the relational um, aspects of them, their effective and their sensorial impact. Um, or maybe it's tag and I'm just talking about a waffle. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. <laughs>